Hello friends, I, Jeannie Anu, project lead for the story project 11 by www.tellmeyourstory.biz welcome you to the third session of this month of the Letters from Santa series. The project Letters from Santa is addressed to parents and children. Though Santa is a mythical creation, most of us are blessed with the participation of our parents, especially the mothers in our life who look after us, take care of us, fulfill our wishes, and guide us in the right path. This project aims at providing insightful guidance and evoke interest in certain aspects of life that may shape the life of children better. Today, I am privileged to have Neil De Silva and Ankit Raj Oja for the panel discussion titled The Magic of Math and Science. Let me begin with introducing the panelists. Neil De, Neil De Silva is a horror author with over 12 books, including the bestsellers Maya's New Husband, Yakshini, and Playthings. His publishers include Penguin Random House, Rupa, Hashit, and HarperCollins, among others. He has been mentioned in publications such as The Times of India, Midday, and others as a leading author of the contemporary horror genre in India. He also writes for Screen. Neil also speaks on various TEDx platforms and frequents prominent literature festivals across the country as a panelist. He mentors people to write on various platforms, including as a mentor with the Scholastic Writers Academy. A keen fitness enthusiast, he hopes that more creative pe people find the right balance between mind and body. Coming to our next panelist, Ankit Raj Ojha is a poet and assistant professor of English from Chapra, Bihar. He has been an engineer with Infosys and currently teaches at Government College, Gharaunda, Karnal. He recently did his PhD from IIT Roorkee and he co-edits the Hooghly Review. Ankit is published in nine countries, including John Hopkins University Press, Rutledge, Shahita Academy, and Outlook, among other venues. He's the author of Pinpricks. So let's set sailing. Please tell us about some of your memorable experiences in the science and math classes during your school days. Tell me your story. I would like to begin with Neil, sir. Thank you so much, Jenya, and that introduction was fabulous. It okay. was too long. Fine, I will go with it. So thanks, and uh, this is a very unique chat. I have been looking forward to it because letters from Santa, and this is probably the first time that I have been invited to talk on my love for my school subjects. Whether love or not, that we'll see. I'll be talking about it. So. Uh, I'll go back to, I think, my ninth grade. And uh, I was always academically good. So I was always, you know, the, the topper or maybe the second topper or the third, some, within the first three ranks in my school days. But there was this one subject that I used to be a little scared of. And that was math. So the reason behind it was that I felt that all the other subjects, they you could get a grip on those. You have notes, you have the textbook, you have the theory in place, and you understand how you go about it. But maths is something like this unknown monster kind of thing. You are given a problem and you don't know what that is. It will mostly be a problem that you have never seen before. And that problem will, you'll have to tackle it, you'll have to solve it, you'll have to get an answer. And that answer has to be precise. So uh, though I enjoyed the math classes, I enjoyed the problems, I enjoyed the learning part of it. When the exams approached, I was a little bit uh, like, how would I do this? So my marks would be like in the other subjects, they would be 90s and up. But in math, they would be somewhere in the 70s and 80s. And this continued from my first grade till my eighth. So then we came on to the ninth, now ninth grade in my times at least it was considered to be one of the most crucial years because it was that year before your ssc board exam your 10th standard board exam and uh, 
you know, getting a good grade in the ninth standard was very important. Uh, we had a class test in the beginning of the year itself. And in that class test, I remember the topic, it was irrational numbers and surfs. So the class test, I did very bad. So it was like um, out of 25 marks, I got about 12 or 13, very bad. So when that happened, now that was my lowest score throughout for math. And uh, that was the time I thought that I had to do something. And then there was also this one teacher that we had at that time. His name was Raja Pantra, Raja sir. So uh, he was the one who told me that uh, if you are so good in other subjects, why is math such a scary thing for you? So you sit extra with me. So that was the year when math became my friend. And uh, you know, uh, every problem that came, I could understand why the problem was such, why, what was the uh, basic of it, what was the core of it. And uh, by the time the year came to an end, I was, of course, I started scoring very well from the next exam onwards. Uh, in fact, when the 10th standard board exam happened, I was one of the toppers in Maharashtra. I suppose I got 148 out of 150 in maths. So those changes happened in the last two years itself, and uh, largely due to Raja sir, who gave me that, you know, private kind of tutelage during those years. And, you know, one thing that I understood in those two years is that math is not an unknown monster in fact i was thinking that math is a very unpredictable subject but later on i understood that math is very predictable in fact if you have a proper grip on all the formulas and the theories that you know how to go about it the process is all known to you then math is your friend and uh, then it went on i post graduated in organic chemistry math was my subject for a few years in the beginning uh, I post graduated in organic chemistry and then I went on to start a coaching institute of my own so where I taught among other subjects math for 18 years and my uh, students from that time they still remember me they still remember how I taught them and uh, you know th this is my story my special relationship with math now I'm teaching my son because now he's in 12th standard so just yesterday I have started differential equations for him so we are going to sit again after this talk is over. We're looking forward to that as well. Thank you, sir. And yes, integration and differentiation has been a very, it has been a challenge for me and as well as permutation and combination. I never understood the concept. I love it. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Coming to Ankit, sir. Sir, what is your take on this particular question? Uh, I have loved physics uh, as um, I mean, as long as I remember. I mean, uh, my favorite subjects back in school would be uh, physics, general knowledge, English, and Hindi, of course, because uh, now I'm in literature. Uh, but uh, especially after doing my tenth examinations, when I uh, when I was enrolled in the eleventh class, uh, the bridge is uh, I mean too too much of a of it. I mean, uh, in 10th standard, you have to read uh, basic stuff on, in science. And uh, uh, when a kid uh, goes into the 11th standard, it becomes too much. So the, I took that as a challenge and I started enjoying it, especially the physics part. Uh, uh, chemistry was a bit of a struggle for me, especially, uh, especially physical chemistry. I couldn't uh, comprehend mole, molar and all. Uh, I was very bad at it. But yeah, I uh, one of the books I remember from my 11, 12 standard is uh, uh, the one by Halliday, Resnick, and Walker. I mean, Neil sir, uh, should know. Uh, so every chapter in that book uh, begins with a kind of a cliffhanger, a mystery. Uh, for instance, uh, somebody went uh, to such and such a place, and uh, there was a lightning strike nearby, and uh, that person's hair began to rise. Uh, uh, just like, uh, as we see in the anchor switches advertisement. So uh, what was the reason? Uh, I mean, they, they they put a cliffhanger at the beginning of, of the chapter and you, you're supposed to solve it as you read through the chapter and uh, whether they'll answer uh, somewhere in the chapter. So that uh, thing, uh, that little science and lit literature together, that uh, got me hooked to physics, especially in my 11th standard. So, yeah, I, I wanted to do uh, physics uh, uh, in my higher studies. So that's how I went into engineering. And But then one thing led to another. And now here I am teaching English to 
undergrads and postgrads. So life has taken a very so life has taken a very means a drastic turn for you from physics to absolute humanities. Uh, yeah. Okay, that was obviously quite interesting. Now coming to the second question of the session, it is often said that it is the teachers that the students fall in love with. The subject comes later. Would you have fond, funny, or inspiring memories of the teachers who taught science subjects to you? So Neil, sir, had already talked about one of the teachers who had helped him get through his math. But uh, what about science? Do you want me to go first? Yeah. So uh, now I'll talk about chemistry, which was my subject of post-graduation, so how it happened. So in our days, there was no vocational counseling, no guidance. I mean, there might have been, but we never had access to them. We did not know where they were. So by the time the ninth grade came, but that was the transition year for me in many ways. Um, I had no clue of what I'm going to do after my death. I knew that it would be science, but uh, what would I do going into science and after that? So what happened is at this time in this year, in fact, all my teachers were fabulous. Uh, I come from a school which is very reputed here in Mumbai, that is Children's Academy. And uh, we had a battery of teachers, all of them excellent in their subject and all of them really inspiring people. So it will, if I go on to talk about my anecdotes with all of them, this will be a very long session. I'll probably write a book about it someday. So I'll just talk about one person who really inspired me at this point, And that was Mrs. Indira Menon. So she just retired a few years back as a principal of our school. So, uh, at that time, she used to teach chemistry. And she was uh, very, 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 very proficient at the subject. Like she would just come in the class and her lecture would always be the second lecture of the day, English and then chemistry. She would come in the class and breeze through the subject. She would, uh, we had those big, huge green boards on which you had to write with chalk. So, you know, her writing was also absolutely beautiful. So she would write so wonderfully, all those equations and all, and then patiently explain those things, how it happens and all. And it was also, it was just like watching a movie. It was not even like a lecture. It was like you're watching something, which is a performance. You know, sometimes some lectures are really performances. So her lectures used to be those kind of things uh, and all the students whether they loved science or not whether they understood science or not they would just watch at watch at the lecture like how she would go about it so this person this lady mrs indira menon she started noticing me and then we had a nice uh, kind of bonding also because i was very good at chemistry so now i'm <coughs> talking about that particular episode so, you know, September 5th is Teacher's Day. I mean, schools, Teacher's Day is celebrated in a big way. So, uh, in that particular year, when I was in the ninth grade, they had a kind of a, uh, what should I say, an event kind of thing, where the ninth grade children would go and teach in the other classrooms. So, they asked me, of course, in the IT class, like, who wants to do the teaching? I put my hand up. I love teaching anyway. So I put my hand up and I was, this is just ninth grade, okay? So she asked me like, what subject do you want to teach? I said, I'll teach chemistry. So like, are you sure you want to teach chemistry? So what chapter that I have done do you want to teach? So I said that uh, I want to teach lead. Now the thing lead, you know, the metal lead. So we had a chapter on lead. So uh, she said, are you sure? Because I am not taught lead in class yet. So I said, uh, no, I want to teach lead. And I want to teach it in uh, 9th C. I was in 9th day at that So she said, are you completely sure you want to do this? I said, yes. And uh, she then trained me. She sat for uh, half an hour. And she taught me lead, only me, so that I could go in that other classroom and teach. And then I went on. On teacher's day, I went and taught in that particular classroom. When I taught, uh, all the teachers they had, I remember them, they were just making their rounds 
the team in um, you know outside the classroom where I was teaching, and some of the teachers gave me a thumbs up just for cheering me up. And uh, later on, I came to know that uh, the uh, individual teacher was very impressed. She was very happy. She in fact said that uh, now because Neil has taught lead, I am not going to teach lead in this class. <laughs> that kind of thing. She might have meant it as a joke, but it was you know a big ego booster for the 14 year old me. And this was where my chemistry journey began. Of course, the lecture went very well. I had a good. Uh, I mean, that class was my rival class. We had those kinds of you know kind of things. Many bullies in that class, but still they sat forward. And that was where I decided that okay, I'll be a teacher. Not only will I be a teacher in my future life, but I'll also take chemistry. So that September fifth of nineteen ninety was the day when I decided that I will take chemistry as my post graduation. And uh, it was all thanks to Indira teacher. I I I went on to do organic chemistry, and it all started. From so the fifth of September was the birth of another teacher. Then, <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Uh, coming to Ankit sir, sir, what about you, means, uh, How how means, uh, how has teachers in school uh, helped you be the one that you are today? Means how have they influenced you? Uh, I won't uh, reduce this to uh, my science teachers only. I'll begin with my one of my English teachers back when I was in class three. Uh, we had Anima ma'am, uh, a very nice lady who used to teach us English. And uh, she was the first person, I mean, uh, my father, of course, he is a, an English professor. So uh, every time my father would praise me for, for my expression, for my language writing and stuff, I would used to think he, uh, Papa hai, inka to kaam hai kehna. He's my father, he'll obviously praise me. So I, I didn't take it seriously. Uh, but when uh, in class, uh, after one of my class tests, Anima ma'am uh, announced it in the class that uh, the toppers are so and so. And uh, there is this kid who is who is not even among the top five rankers, but I loved his expression the most. And somehow we did end up scoring the, uh, the maximum marks, but yeah, I liked his expression. If he keeps on uh, writing like this, I'll, I'm sure he'll, he'll do good. So that's uh, when I realized that I I, I should uh, focus on uh, reading and writing because uh, it's not just my father who sees that I can do it. And uh, after Anima, ma'am, I would like to name uh, Iqbal, sir, Mr. Iqbal Hussain, uh, who used to teach us physics and maths in uh, classes 8, 9, and 10th. Uh, up to 12, uh, I remember. Iqbal sir was uh, the first uh, teacher uh, uh, about whom I, I would uh, say that he was the guru figure we, we have in India, in the Indian tradition. And uh, there used to be uh, an, a big uh, hall in his home uh, where there was um, there were many benches. And, uh, and that, that hall would remain open for uh, up to 10 to 15 hours every day. And all of uh, us all of uh, the kids, we were welcome to go to his house, sit in that room, uh, take his books, borrow his books. Uh, some of us, uh, some of them uh, didn't even return <laughs> return those books. And it, it was kind of a gurukul. I mean, uh, that's what Iqbal said had created for us. And we could disturb him anytime. Uh, uh, even uh, in his sleeping hours, we could uh, wake him up. Uh, Sir, uh, we are stuck at this and this thing. Please guide us. And he would have so that kind of gurukul is um, uh, what I think every kid should have uh, at some point in their life. So uh, yeah, I have really fond memories of Iqbal sir. The, these teachers are who I think uh, made me. Thank you, sir. So all of you, means both of you have a science background and have forayed into the world of creative writing. What was the moment or phase of call when you plunged into a creative career? I would like also like to ask, do you believe that li literature is creative and science is not? And I would like to begin this time with Ankit, sir. Uh, there is not uh, a single moment. There are many. Uh, it begins with uh, my bedtime stories, which uh, my mother and my grandma used to narrate to me. And that was uh, when I realized the power of language and expression and how captivating it, it, it can be for a child in their early ages, in their formative years. 
so after my uh, grandma and mother there was my father who who used to uh, host his students and teach them literature and i, I was uh, i happened to uh, sit uh, among those students and that's where i learned uh, one thing or another about literature uh, so uh, many of uh, Shakespeare's stories that uh, I mean the English classics, Milton's Paradise Lost, and all Wordsworth and all, uh, I, I recall from my uh, having learned in my childhood from my father's home classes, and uh, after that uh, I can say my grandpa used to uh, get me these uh, popular Hindi magazines, Champak, Nandan, and Nanne Samrat. So those I remember very fondly. <laughs> So th there are many instances uh, I can think of that uh, that have made me fall in love with language and literature. And in school, uh, I was introduced to the stories by uh, Ruskin Bond, Jayant Narlikar, Satyajit Ray. And I also uh, had the fortune of uh, being a member of the Ramkrishna Mission Ashram Library in my hometown in Chapra. So uh, they had a huge treasure trove of uh, books. Uh, so, uh, as a class eight student, I remember falling in love with the writings of uh, Agatha Christie, J.K. Rowling, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, and others. So, yeah, that's how my journey into literature began. And uh, sh should I go on to your next question? What was it again? Uh, sir, do you think that uh, literature is more creative and science is not? Uh, I think uh, both are creative. I can't uh, say that one is creative and the other is not. Uh, you obviously don't need to stress the need, uh, stress the creative aspect of literature. I mean, all of us acknowledge it. We know it's creative. Uh, science folks, on the other hand, are often on the receiving end of jokes uh, for being apparently bring mechanical and whatnot. Uh, I, uh, we should remind ourselves that uh, had these boring blokes not been creative enough, to observe things around us, come up with hypotheses and design experiments to prove their observations. Uh, we wouldn't have known all we know today about life, the universe and reality itself. So, uh, I mean, the first person who would have thought of uh, stuff existing on uh, the subatomic scale, the quantum mechanics that is, that person would have had one big creative mind to conceive uh, such far-fetched fantasies uh, at that time. Uh, now, coming to literature, I think uh, some of our most celebrated uh, uh, people in maths and science have been gifted with a brilliant uh, expression, a literary language. Uh, take Newton, for instance, uh, his third law of motion, third law, he says, for every act, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I mean, this sentence is poetry. It's so beautiful. Newton could have rambled on and on and on. Uh, but he chose to put his findings in this short, sweet, crisp little sentence. Uh, that's why I think some of the most best sellers are uh, science like uh, Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and my own favorite, Richard Feynman. So uh, this beauty, this beauty of expression is what you get when creativity is not reduced to being called merely as scientific or literary. Thank you so much, sir. That was a really good expression to the question. Thank you. So, Neil, sir, so what is your take on this particular question? Uh, you have to just refresh what the first question was removed by the second. Uh, sure. So, I was asking you that uh, since all of means both of you have science background, you suddenly thought of delving into the world of creative writing. So, yeah. when was it that you realized? that uh, creative writing is your career and uh, whether literature is creative or and science is not so i write horror um, and uh, i think i uh, had a fascination for the horror world right from my school days i i love the stories of dracula frankenstein i watched Z horror show a lot. I watched Ahat a lot. The Ramsey movies, uh, they were all around the house because my dad used to subtitle them, you know, from Hindi to English. So he, he had that, he worked in that department. So uh, all those movies were also at home around us. And uh, English was one of my languages, strong points, you know, where I uh, could express myself beautifully. 
when I read books in that age, you know, one of the things was, of course, the stories captivated me. I enjoyed the story. But more than that, there was this kind of a niggling thought that uh, I need to have a book in my name. You know, how it would appear if my name is on the cover of a book and that book is on a bookshelf somewhere or maybe in some reader's hands and somebody is reading it and I don't even know that person, what kind of connection it would be. You know, so that is what that is a magical connection that all the authors have because I don't know right now at this moment who in the world is reading something that I wrote. So that is a kind of thing that, of course, I was not so profound when I was this uh, 12, 13 or whatever my age was at that time. But I had that thought that I want to write. That's it. And that power of expression it came out in many ways. My dad had a typewriter and in the summer vacations, I would just hack my stories on that typewriter. Tip, 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 you know, that kind of sound all over the house, black, black. And I would type those stories on loose sheets of paper then uh, staple them together, draw a cover and give the books to my friends and sometimes to my teachers. I would make them read it. It's difficult to make my friends read the books now that I'm a published author. But in those days, my friends would read. And uh, that was how it somewhere began in a very, very, very small rudimentary kind of thing. That said, I was not from a literary background or a publishing background or something like that. So nobody in my house uh, is an author or works in the publishing industry even remote. So I did not know how to actually get a book published. I mean a real book, not one that you type at home. So I went into the coaching class business, as I said, and I taught there for 18 years. And uh, I loved teaching. It was one of my biggest passions at that point of time in my youthful age. And I taught, but there was this thought that started growing upon me. That thought was, you are in this one classroom, you are teaching all these subjects year after year, the same thing, regurgitating knowledge. And what's happening to your students? They are learning from you, they are getting the marks, they are going all over the world, and you are in that classroom. You know, that began to become a kind of a claustrophobic, suffocating thought, and I could not shake it away. And by the time 2014 came, you know, the year 2014. I had started my classes in 1996. Uh, when 2014 came, I was so distraught by this one particular clawing feeling that I felt that I'm going towards the deep end and I don't know what. I'm a creative person and my creativity is getting stifled in this one classroom uh, and chalk and board and dust and whatever it is. So that is where I expressed these thoughts to my wife, Anita. And she said, that if you are so, uh, I mean, profoundly, deeply thinking about this, then give it up. Stop those classes. We don't want them. We don't want the money that the classes brings in. Write a book. Write a book and show me that you can write and show the world. That That's how she knew a little, very little bit about my writing thing because, you know, uh, I wrote a poem for her when we were, you know, like, okay. I'll not get into that. So she knew only that much about my writing book and not my, not anything beyond that. But even then she gave me the confidence that, okay, if you want to write a book and you're thinking so passionately about it, write it. I wrote the book. We were in Goa at that time, we were holidaying. And, uh, in Goa itself, after my kids and uh, my wife, they went to bed, I took out my laptop and I started outlining my story. I started writing down. I got such a sense of relief, I'll tell you. Because it was like, for many years, I was thinking that, okay, I want to write. Like, I want to write. Something is stuck up in my brain. I don't know how to vent it. And then now I was actually venting. I was actually writing the stories. I was seeing the scene form. I was seeing the characters happen. And I did it. I had the classes going on still because the year was still continuing. I wrote the book. I wrote it in a month. I wrote it in November of 2014 and I published it, self-published. My first book was self-published uh, in January of 2015, on the 3rd of January. And fortunately, the book became a hit. People read it. It was on Amazon number one for a long time, for two years in the horror category. And uh, I got that, you know, that kind of thing, that confidence that, okay, I can write. And I wrote. And I'm still writing. And the journey continues.
This is how it works. Well, well that was one heck of a journey. Yes. So, coming to the fourth question of the session. Do you believe that whatever be the career one chooses to pursue, math and science will always have an influence? Means how has your knowledge in math and science inspired your thinking and subsequent writing? I'd like to begin again with Ankit, sir. Yeah, uh, coming to your first question about uh, the, the, the impact, of, impact of studying maths and science, uh, that uh, is, this is right, yeah? Okay, so I think uh, maths and science, uh, these uh, subjects wire the human brain in a certain way. I mean, I'm not saying that those who don't study maths and science uh, are missing out in some way, but but yeah, then all of us do read maths and science in our school, in our schools at some point of time. In my case, uh, studying maths and science along with along with literature has uh, introduced me to a far bigger pool of resources than studying only literature would have uh, gotten me exposed to. Uh, this has had its positive effect, uh, yeah, on my thinking and my writing. Uh, it's not just I, but uh, anyone who is open to reading from a variety of sources, who is uh, not, who does not uh, discriminate uh, on that. I mean, I'm not supposed to read this subject. Uh, this is not mine. Yeah, anyone uh, can have a mind that knows no boundaries, an agile mind uh, that uh, is not bound by chains. Uh, I mean, think of uh, the, the the ancient and medieval scholars like Pythagoras, Da Vinci, Indian rishis. And even in more recent times, uh, our own Rabindranath Tagore, all of these were uh, were many things at once. Uh, there were painters, architects, engineers, uh, writers, philosophers. The ancient ones were surgeons as well. I mean, uh, how 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 was it this possible? So this was possible because knowledge, I believe, is uh, all of it is a unity. I mean, it is humans who have made categories out of uh, knowledge, like at the category of maths, science, commerce, uh, language, and so on. Uh, this, of course, has its own practical purposes. But uh, when we start uh, reaching a stage when uh, we have begun to trace our way back on the circle of knowledge, uh, to see knowledge once again as a unity, uh, that's when I believe all comes full circle, when we uh, begin to see everything everywhere all at once. Uh, and that's when I think uh, some of the best writing is born. So uh, reading from a lot of resources, uh, yeah, it uh, does things to your brain, very good things. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, one of my poems, I mean, I won't read it. It's called Cavities. You can find it online. Uh, I have used concepts from mathematics uh, uh, in that poem. And uh, some of some people from my background really appreciated it. So yeah. Uh, Maths and science, yeah, they, they they do shape a person's mind in very in really nice ways. Thank you, sir. Sir, what is your take on the question, Neil, sir? So I think uh, we are going to always have this relationship with maths and science. It doesn't matter what academic background you come from, what you have studied, you will always have maths and science in your life whether in recognizable shapes or not, but it will always be there. So I, in fact, skipped your previous uh, question also when you asked about whether math and science is creative or not. So I just combined the two things. So the thing is, uh, you know, the creativity aspect of math and science, which people do not understand is, uh, you know, there, are, there there is a lot of creativity, whether it is math or, you know, whatever these subjects that you are talking about. As a teacher, I know that when I used to set problems for my students, I used to twist the problems and uh, treat them in different ways, sometimes camouflage the answers so that people don't know what they are getting at. And that, that, that was one of the very direct creative parts of it. But uh, you know, there is also the thing that the entire process of any invention or discovery, it begins with a thought. And the thought has to be a creative thing because you are trying to make something which does not exist. So that is where the whole creativity comes in. So maths and science, they don't teach you only to smug up certain formula and basics and 
just go and you know implement them and apply them or whatever it is it also teaches you to observe it also teaches you to see what is already existing and try to understand why the things that there are other things that we don't know yet but they may exist and here i'll talk about again what i write i write horror and when we write horror we are often faced with the question of do ghosts really exist or not you know that question is something that i'm always asked and today i think you know i can answer this in a better way because we are blending this with the topic of math and science so uh, we think that these two things are completely close apart like uh, ghosts the paranormal itself is a matter of belief and uh, math and science is a matter of observation inference conclusions is there because they are right there but the thing is what we what i see it as i see the whole universe as a kind of a as a kind of an infinity as a kind of thing that we do not have a handle on we don't know where it starts we don't know where it ends and hindu mythology is the best in expressing the infiniteness of our universe now in this universe we are just a very small being we do not occupy any space in the entire scheme of the universe we are very very infinite so now the thing is we who are so small so tiny who can observe only a small minuscule fraction of this entire universe how can we say that this exists and this does not exist with such confidence how do we say that like people who say that ghosts exist again i ask them do you have you seen a ghost have you actually witnessed any paranormal experience is that so or people who say that i don't believe that ghosts exist ghosts do not exist i ask them again that how do you know that ghosts do not exist do you know the full extent of the universe if you believe in god why do you say that ghosts do not exist so the thing is that science teaches us to be creative it teaches us to keep us an open mind about things and especially if the things are unknown we understand that what is the extent at what we are today and for, and we don't know many of the things beyond it like uh, for example it's uh, we know the human body's composition right we know what we are made up of today we completely know that we have the 20 basic building blocks we know what makes up our cell we know all the organelles we know all the chemicals uh, everything which is inside the cell we also know the structure of the dna we know everything but tell me can we replicate it can we make a single human cell and give it life we cannot do that why we cannot do that is because our science has not gone till there so here two things have to work number one we have to have the belief that we can reach that point where sometime in the future maybe i don't know we will be able to replicate life we will be able to make life happen some people have done that already the yuri and the miller experiment where the cell blocks were actually created but that is not life those are just cells but i think we are moving in that direction too and let's not bring cloning into the picture because cloning is not originating life it is just duplicate we have not done that and the second thing is that we have to believe that science is creative so so far all the knowledge that we have of science we should understand that it is not the complete knowledge yet it is not even the smallest fraction of what science might actually have to offer there might be a there is a lot more which we don't know and only our opening of thought opening of mind will help us you know understand those things and get to that position uh, the best example we have is how newtonian physics that is the classic mechanics newton's laws how they immediately changed when einstein came into the picture like when einstein came he said that uh, everything is not just mass there is also an energy component to it then we had the mass energy relationship and then everything changed because every newton's equation is now looked upon in a different way because we now have the energy expression put into it i don't know what will happen tomorrow again something else will come relativity changed classical mechanics now something else will come and change and uh, today i am in contact with paranormal investigators so paranormal investigators are people who actually go to these haunted places where ghosts are expected to be there 
they go there and they try to investigate whether ghosts are really there or not. Now, paranormal investigators work in various ways. No two paranormal investigators have the same modus operandi. So one of them might actually, I mean, somebody might use their psychic sense if they have a developed sense. Again, we don't know what is the sixth sense. So, you know, there's so much in science that we don't know. We don't know why deja vu happens. We don't know why we feel uh, positive and negative vibes when we are talking to somebody. We don't know what is an aura, but we all believe in it. We don't know what is the soul. Anyway, so some people have a strengthened, fortified, intense psychic sense through which they can understand things. Some people rely on scientific tools. That also happens. So in my recent book, Playthings, I also used the ghost meter. The ghost meter is a device which uh, calculates that not not really calculates detects the electromagnetic frequency variations in a particular place so it is believed that ghosts have energy right that is the belief that paranormal science works on so if ghosts have energy then they should create a fluctuation in the emf of the area so if you there's this device called as a ghost meter which can detect that so by that you can understand that okay there are ghosts here or at least there is something that is beyond the natural. So there are people who are using scientific tools, even in this regard, to, you know, detect if there is a supernatural presence in a particular area or not. So this is how creativity blends together. And this is how maths and science is used, uh, at least in my field, that is the horror field, on a day-to-day -day basis, even now. We are, are, and, and I write books about it. Uh, I would like to add to uh, your answer, Neil, sir, um, if I'm allowed. Yeah, uh, I totally sure. agree with you that, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, um, brilliant answer, that is. Uh, <clears throat> I, th I do think that we're, I mean, uh, today's magic is tomorrow's science. I mean, uh, if, if we believe in the existence of God or gods, uh, why, why not believe in the existence of ghosts? I mean, uh, it's all part of the metaphysics. So uh, <clears throat> I remember one of uh, uh, one of uh, certain the celebrated conversations between Albert Einstein and Rabindranath Tagore back in the 1930s. I mean, it's available on the internet, and uh, even Einstein, uh, a scientist, agrees on many of uh, Tagore's takes on religion, uh, on the existence of God, and so on. So that that is something. Uh, I mean. Um, also, uh, the, the reason that they, they named the Higgs boson as the God's particle uh, says something. We, 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 we may, might be able to create cells, but how to breathe life into cells out of nowhere? That's something, something to ponder about. There was this entire thing about Charles Darwin. Uh, when Charles Darwin was on his deathbed, mm -hmm. uh, he actually spoke uh, I, I i don't know whom he mentioned it to but he did say that i have spent my entire life in trying to understand the theory of evolution i have done a lot on that i have written books on it and i think i have changed the world's perspective but i today when i as i lay dying i understand that uh, despite all my work i have done on evolution and now I believe that uh, there is some force, some energy that made all those changes happen. How does evolution just happen like that? Of, of course, forces of nature do come into play, but there is something that is also, you know, like a puppeteer working the strings. And he said that that is that force, which is the unknown force that we don't know about. And that's what he says, what people call as God or whatever it is. That is the belief. So this is what even Darwin acknowledged at the end of his life that, uh, my theories are not complete. Yeah. Thank you exactly. so much. Thank you so much. So yes, we come to our third panelist, uh, Mr. Stuart Gibbs. Uh, we uh, means he has been facing technical issues uh, while joining our session, but we welcome you, sir. Let me introduce my, our third panelist. Stuart Caves is the author of five New York Times best-selling series, Spy School, Fun Jungle, Charlie Thorne, Moon Base Alpha, and Once Upon a Tip. He has also written screenplays and developed TV shows for every Hollywood studio and TV network. In college, he researched capybaras, the world's largest rodents. He now lives in Los Angeles with his family. I welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I am 
terribly, terribly sorry about <laughs> this. It's, it's uh, I shouldn't really have technical problems getting onto a uh, a, a science based uh, uh, thing, but um, it, it was uh, I found my uh, computer had done a reboot over the night, and it's very early in the morning here. And so by the time I got everything up and running again, uh, that it took me a lot longer to get on than I had hoped. So I'm tremendously sorry about that. And I know we've gone way down and I, I was catching uh, some of the uh, audio there and, and, and already impressed by what everybody has to say here. So thank you very much for having me. And again, a huge apology for this. Thank you, sir. So, sir, let me bombard you with a few of the questions that I meant to ask you if you were from the beginning. So, sir, please tell us about some of your memorable experiences in science and math classes during your school days. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I always found, and, and I apologize if this goes into any, anything anyone else talked about, but, you know, the more hands-on uh, uh, the science could be, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I think we just remembered that, right? So, so the, the, I, you know, my school days were a while ago, but uh, you know, the, like the day that they allowed us to uh, uh, actually go outside and, and do, you know, use water rockets, ready to figure out how much water and how much compressed air to put into like a little plastic rocket to shoot that off. That was the day we waited for all year in science because we finally got to go and do something involved experimentation and, and, and go outside and. Uh, so uh, when I, um, I always loved biology, but, uh, but the parts of biology I love were the parts like where we were doing, you know, dissections and, and actually getting to, to, you know, be physically involved. And uh, so when, when I ended up doing my, uh, getting interested in field biology, that was because, you know, that was, a, that was actually, a, you know, a college class where we uh, were never in class. We were always off uh, at, at an arboretum, uh, learning how to ban birds and track birds and and moving around through the woods or, or uh, you know, my capybara uh, uh, project came out of just uh, uh, them sending us to the zoo to, you know, uh, start work with any animal that we wanted to and uh, just start trying to make some observations uh, at the zoo. And then that then, you know, snowballed into uh, other stuff. But, but, you know, when you're actually sitting there uh, getting to, to um, you know, do the, you know, you're, even though, you know, a, a lot of field biology is just sort of sitting still and watching something, you're at least engaged with it, you're doing something. And that was, uh, so that, you know, any class where you, you could do something rather than do, uh, you know, that was, that was, uh, you know, do something rather than read uh, or be lectured, that uh, always stood out to me. Thank you, sir. And sir, uh, since you had also a science background and you have forged into the world of creative writing, so what made you plunge into this creative career? And I would also like to ask you whether you think that literature is creative and science is not. Oh, I, I think there's a huge ability for science to be creative. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think all scientific innovation comes from, from, uh, you know, people uh, being, uh, you know, uh, being creative. Uh, I, uh, you know, I just always wanted to write. I wanted to write more than I wanted to be a scientist. But I knew that all along. Uh, science was sort of uh, like my, my second love. Uh, uh, particularly biology, and uh, you know, it was while I was doing my uh, capybara project at the zoo, uh, which led to me spending a lot of time working behind the scenes at the zoo. That that actually gave rise to my first book series because I I wanted to do something. I realized I wanted to do something set at a zoo where I could bring in uh, you know all all this uh, all, all like these fun. Uh, things about about the animals that were also at the zoo and uh, and work those into the story and do a series that was very um, uh, you know that they could talk about uh, issues of, of evolution and uh, and ecology and and biology and, uh, and and so sort of educate kids in a fun way as well as uh, entertain them thank you so much sir so if you would give me another chance to ask a very common question, which has already been asked to others. So do you believe that whatever be the career one chooses to pursue, math and science will always have an influence? And how has your knowledge in math and science inspired your thinking and subsequent writing? 
Uh, I think that, that uh, yeah, I mean, I think math and science uh, always have uh, a place uh, in, in, I mean, like certainly we, we, we need as many people in the, in the sciences and I mean, math is possible, but, uh, but, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it definitely comes into play in my, in my books. I, I, uh, I was, I was highly, highly influenced by Michael Crichton, uh, who, um, you know, I like. Uh, I mean, I hope people are aware of my, but, but you know, who's most famous for Jurassic Park, probably, but also, uh, you know, like I discovered him through a book called Congo, which, uh, um, which was just this great sort of adventure of a bunch of scientists heading off into uh, Africa, and uh, some of the science in it is outdated. Some of the technology is outdated, but a lot of the science is still there. And and the idea that you could combine science and adventure. Uh, I just love that, and I and that and uh, you know. So I uh, I think that that uh, like I'm I'm still trying to do that. I love when I encounter other people who are trying to do that uh, because uh, I, you know I don't know who who I just, who wouldn't find science fascinating. I think there there's lots of great ways to make math fascinating too. Sometimes our uh, or a lot of the time I think the way it's taught in school is does not make it as fascinating as it actually is. And there are ways to do it. But so sometimes what I'm trying to do with my writing is show people how, uh, how, how, how fascinating math and science can be. That's what I'm trying to do a lot of the time. Thank you so much, sir. So coming to this uh, very specific person question, I would like to begin with Neil, sir, this time. Sir, you are a well-known name in horror fiction. Did you implement science and joining certain dots in your manuscript means i can't stop myself from correlating your post-graduation in organic chemistry with the horror and supernatural elements in your books appealing to reader's psyche uh, so i already spoke about how the paranormal science uh, today tries to probe into you know the existence of ghosts and spirits by the means of various equipment that we have at our disposal to name some, you know, ghost meter I already spoke about, which is the EMF sensing meter, but then there are also thermal sensors, uh, infrared thermometers, and various other things that uh, can help you uh, just know whether there is something that is beyond what should be natural in a particular area. And that is how these things work. I, I think the movie Conjuring showed a lot of it. Uh, there was this entire investigation kind of approach to it where implements and devices were set up and uh, things went haywire when the ghosts made their appearance. So apart from that, you know, that is the, quite a, an, a very obvious way of looking at it. But uh, I write things like about serial killers, about murders and gore and stuff like that. Uh, some of my books are also, you know, quite cool, quite difficult to read. And uh, I, in fact, my first book was like that, Maya's New Husband, where I had to actually describe people cutting, uh, cutting up people's organs and how is that done, how do you preserve it. And for that, I needed to go back to my science. I needed to know how you would preserve a heart, a human heart, for more than a year, uh, or how would you boil a human food. Those kinds of things. I know I'm being very morbid, but these are the kinds of things that I had to go and research. Coming to some lesser morbid territory, or sometimes you have to use physics. Like if there is an action scene, how would things work? Would uh, a projectile ricochet from a surface, and what would it do? So, of course, I know that in fiction writing, all these things don't matter. And our director Rohit Shetty has shown that it definitely does not matter. But as authors who want to create a kind of realism to their work, uh, we do have to go in these things sometimes and try to see whether it's uh, Sometimes I have to do research on architecture, which I also believe is a kind of science. Because uh, you need to describe how, you need to describe how a building is uh, constructed or how the road is built. And you know, for those things, again, you need to have a lot of knowledge. Not a lot of knowledge because we you know show don't tell so not a lot of knowledge but you need to have those particular points where your read your writing looks authentic the scene that you have built looks authentic so i think that's the extent of it plus of course a lot of the research that goes uh, in my work more than the science part of it is the spiritualism part of it. 
because I when I write horror, and Indian horror is very spiritual based. We don't write about uh, vampires and werewolves. We write about uh, our ghosts and demons are also somewhere connected with the positive side of nature because you know they come together. So we have this. Uh, so for example, if I'm writing an exorcism scene. Now, if I'm going to write an exorcism scene, I cannot just have a demon without showing the positive force uh, that is going to exercise the demon. So that kind of research is, you know, a, yeah, yeah, is the kind of research that I need to do a lot. And uh, that's where science comes in. A lot of science comes in. Thank you so much, sir. Coming to Ankit, sir. sir you had a great leap of journeys means leaps of journey that you had taken I mean, from engineering to professor in english to publishing an anthology of poems titled pinpricks so yes there have been quite a number of leaps in your life so how did you balance your diverse presence or advantage or a disadvantage Uh, am I audible, Jinia? Sure, sir, you are. I, I lost some of what you said. Yeah, yeah. If I'm audible, I'll go on. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, these yeah. leaps uh, that you talk of, uh, my uh, my family, my my family, my wife uh, have been my greatest supports uh, during the transition phases. I mean, my parents have always uh, supported me. There were uh, no unrealistic expectations that we have in many in as families, thankfully, subjected to those uh, doing it. Uh, thanks to my parents, my grandparents, and my my brother also. He is he is a big support, and uh, my my wife uh, at uh, that point of time when I was uh, about to take a big giant. Uh, right now, I'm studying, so it wouldn't have been possible without my parents' support. And uh, I, I also met some uh, really nice folks along the way. Uh, I cannot go uh, from Without these people, I I don't think I'd have taken risks. So yeah, courage. The courage that uh, you need to make such giant leaps. It comes from the people you the people you love, the people who love you back. Uh, did I miss anything? Was there another question? Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to ask you that um, since you had this diverse presence, so was it an advantage or a disadvantage? Uh, I would call it an, an advantage, as I uh, put uh, in some of my put in some of my answers that uh, uh, for fortune to read uh, and know different sources, uh, it adds to your uh, to your um, <coughs> to your library up there. Uh, so yeah, <coughs> it's an advantage. Uh, I can draw from uh, my. Uh, my science background, my maths background, as well as my literary background, and try to create something that caters to uh, tastes of all of, all, all kinds of audiences. Uh, this is an advantage. I also wanted to become a singer at some point in my life, uh, back in my B Tech, I remember. So I used to be part of a few rock bands back in college and back back in back at Infosys, where I used to work as an engineer. And we played gigs in and around town. So yeah, uh, so some of my friends often ask me uh, nowadays, uh, you did it, you did hearing, then you uh, you experimented with music, you uh, you work as an engineer at, at a multinational company, and then you decided to go for uh, masters in English, and then that um, JR. If these are Indian things, uh, Stuart. So, and then <laughs> uh, went for a PhD and teaching at a college. <laughs> so, 
so uh, i mean some of my friends often uh, tell me you, you wasted all those years uh, i tell them a big fat no no i didn't waste any of um, any of that i learned a lot from all of my experiences i mean every experience we have good ones bad ones all all of those experience uh, experiences shape us in some way they they make us what we are we are the sum more than the sum of our experiences that's what i'd like to say thank you so much and coming to uh, stuart stuart your books range from sci fi to fantasies to mysteries for young readers i'm especially intrigued about your moon base alpha series uh the last musketeer series and charlie thorn series so would you please tell us what kind of research you had to undertake during such writing and uh, what kind of creative liberties one can take while writing science fiction without sounding disconnected from reality right uh well i mean the the uh, like charlie thorn and movies alpha i i did a tremendous amount of research on on both those uh moonbase alpha is a this research is set on in the first moon base and uh charlie thorn is uh about a, a girl who is sort of a modern day you know uh einstein as a child who who is uh, you know tasked with trying to track down something that einstein discovered himself at, that that's potentially very dangerous uh and um both those again like uh i wanted to be uh you know very steeped in in actual science uh so um i with with uh, space case the first book in moon base alpha i was exp- i mean that whole series came about because one of my closest friends became an astronaut and so i i was just being exposed to this wealth of of incredible experiences uh uh that uh you know about what modern day space travel was like and then he went to uh run human space flight for spacex and so then i could see like what the future or the near future of space travel is going to be so um So a lot of my research on that was just pestering him constantly with questions. Uh but uh but he could then recommend that I you know I talk to people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and and, and NASA and such. Uh and uh with uh, Charlie Thorne didn't have quite that level of access to like um to people in the forefront of of science but 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 I you know there there were plenty of um uh you know thankfully there's lots written about einstein and 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 what he you know had revolutionized and and then the next book i did darwin which you were talking about i mean there there is so um so i but it but all both those went to this sort of core idea i had about just how you know how much fun science can be uh if if uh it be in as part of a story and uh so <clears throat> i tried to take as few liberties as possible with the science in writing fiction uh you have to make a few jumps obviously but um uh but the the closer to uh uh you know the 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 better my science can be i think the best and then and actually after uh first charlie thorn it it occurred to me that because kids would write to me and say like okay how much of this was actually true that i should put in the back of the book something saying like okay this is this is all true this is all real science except for like this little part here and this is where the you know the fiction comes in uh so uh but yeah so so i for me doing the research is is uh uh for all my series uh is is often one of the most fun parts because it does give me the opportunity to talk to great scientists about what they're doing and and try and take uh some of their best uh pieces of information. I I always ask any science I'm a scientist I'm talking to uh if you could share one fact uh about your work with young readers what would it be? And that fact is usually just something that is just tremendously uh uh fascinating. That I I was there's my I my newest fun jungle book uh involves uh whales and uh uh and and I asked the scientist uh, uh um what uh you know what they found fascinating and he told me that uh you know that that uh, you know you can tell how old a whale is by the build up of, of earwax in their ears uh and I was like that's an amazing fact that I never heard and my, I'm sure my readers would like that too 
Thank you so much. Uh, coming to the end of the session, I would like to pose the same question for everyone. So if you were a Santa, what would be your advice to the little children? So let me start with Ankit. Ankit, sir. Uh, if the question's about Santa, I would like to begin with my Santa. Uh, I have a Santa yes, in my sure. life who I, whom I was introduced to last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If my audience would like to say this to them, don't lose heart. Have fun. A lot of watch movies, read comic books, read novels, do anything you lay your hands on. And I mean, everything adds to your journey. And uh, I have been... Uh, um, uh, habitual of getting rejections uh, uh, on my poems, my stories, my research articles. And uh, that's when I met uh, this gentle person called Mr. Steve He's a selected poet from India. And, uh, he has been mentoring me ever since uh, on, during my ongoing poetry journey. And uh, my first book, Pinpricks, it's a product of his kindness as much as my writings. Uh, so yeah, for the kids, uh, if you find a Santa like I have, very if you keep keep having fun, not hurting. That's what I would like to say to you. Thank you so much, Ankit. Stuart, what is your suggestion or advice to the children? I, I mean, I, I'm going to sort of go off what Ankit was saying. I mean, that that I think I think in in all aspects of life, you know, certainly writing. Uh, most people, uh, a lot of people try it very young, and uh, but even if they don't, there there is uh, there's rejection involved and and everything. And I think it um, the kids need to know uh, that you know if every person had quit after they got rejected, you pretty much wouldn't have any books at all. And not would you, and and that just that's not just uh, for writers. That's you know if if any person quit after their first failure, you we really wouldn't have. Uh, we, we wouldn't have made any progress in science or, or, or anything. And so I think they, they just need to know that, that uh, how important perseverance is and that uh, if, if they have a setback, they should uh, not think that that says anything necessarily about them and their abilities uh, and, and that they just need to keep going forward. Thank you so much, sir. Coming to Neil, sir, so what is your advice? Okay, okay. I think I'm audible now. Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, all right. So uh, my daughter asked me a question, you know, a few days back. She is now in the eighth grade and uh, she has just entered the eighth grade and she has understood the fact that Santa is not real. So uh, the question that she asked me was, now, Papa, that Santa is not real, am I going to stop getting gifts from Santa every year? So what I told her is, okay, so now you have grown and you know what the story behind Santa Claus is. But the thing is, you know, when we are children, Santa brings gifts for us if we are good people. And in later life, you know, you are your own Santa. You have to be good and you have to bring the gifts, uh, uh, rewards in your life by being good persons. So that's what I think is you know we have to discover the santa within ourselves within the people who stand by us our friends our family and that's how it works i mean i was in a bad state a few years back i became my own santa i took fitness seriously and i got the reward of it you know so that it takes time it takes persistence as i said i did not know anybody from the literary world when i started out uh, I wanted to be a published author and uh, I became my own Santa there. I found out the ways and means to do it. I practiced my writing craft and uh, I got my books published. So this is how it works in real life. I think you have to be your own Santa and when you grow up, you realize for the kids, that's uh, those are listening to us. Uh, yes, Santa is real, but not the way that uh, we 
perceive him to be or we think Santa is. But I think uh, we are our own Santa. We have to be that. So yes, we have reached uh, the end of our session and thank you everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this panel discussion. To end with a little short note from my side. So today's discussion has also been quite enriching and uh, we have come to this general conclusion as to that there are many subjects that appear monstrous to us taking our sleep of our eyes and peace from our mind. But then comes our Santa in the person of our parents and teachers who take us off into this wonderful journey across the subjects, introducing us to the mysteries, ridiculous our horror away from the conscious, subconscious and the unconscious of our life. While literature gives us flights of fancy, science and math implement them. So life itself is interdisciplinary Bringing, to, bringing us to focus that every subject has significant contribution to our being. So coming to the end, tell me your story calls for submissions on the story prompt, letters from Santa. Registrations are also open for the writing program season 10. We hope to hear from you. Till then, stay well, stay happy, stay together. Good night. And if I'm not wrong, good morning, Stuart. <laughs>